So the last time President Xi and Putin met, he said something very important. He mentioned how changes not seen for 100 years are coming and we are the ones driving it. And guess what happened five months later? The BRICS expansion happened. And every time these two individuals meet each other, big things happen on the global stage. The world's most powerful economic bloc became even bigger, adding six new countries. And this include the big oil powers like Saudi Arabia and the UAE. So we have to pay attention to the upcoming meeting between Xi and Putin because fireworks will fly. And this next meeting is probably going to be as historic as the last one because Beijing has sent Wang Yi on a visit to Moscow to lay the groundwork. He is basically heading there to coordinate the agenda with Russia's foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov. And this is a Game of Thrones moment because Wang Yi is China's top diplomat. When things get serious and stuff needs to get done, they are sending Wang Yi. He has even scolded the United States and the G7 before. And by sending him to survey the situation in Russia, it kind of tells us that China is increasing their cooperation with Russia. Remember, this is a no-limits partnership. And during the meeting with Wang Yi and Lavrov, both sides came to a conclusion that is very obvious to us. But this in fact changes everything. According to Reuters, Moscow's and Beijing's top diplomats noted closeness in their positions on Washington's anti-Russia and anti-Chinese stance. When you are targeted by the world's number one superpower, what are you going to do? Obviously, you'll band together to form a unified resistance. It's not rocket science. Wang Yi also briefed Lavrov about what happened during his earlier meeting with Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor of the United States. So they are now sharing information as well. And it's clear to see that the sanctions on Russia and the containment of China, all of this are failing. All the risking and decoupling talk are driving these two countries closer together. And it's not a joke and they are likely planning something big. Their economic partnership is going to reach new heights. And I've said this many times and I have to repeat it. Everything makes sense once you view China and Russia through this lens. You need to see them as one unified economic unit. Separately, they have a ton of weaknesses, but together, they are really shaping the new global order. And you don't need to look very far. Putin himself has more or less confirmed this. During the Eastern Economic Forum, he told the world that Western efforts to restrain China's rise as a global power were doomed to fail. I think this should really tell us how close both Beijing and Moscow are taking this relationship. Both Xi and Putin, they didn't attend the G20, right? They knew they wouldn't be hurt there, nothing would get done, and if they want to take steps to shape the new multipolar world, they gotta do it themselves. So let's talk about China and Russia's next economic moves. Both countries are vowing deeper coordination with Wang Yi himself, insisting that the relationship won't be influenced by third parties. And let's begin this with energy supply. We know what Russia has and what China wants, what they need. Lots of oil and gas to power their economy. And it's no surprise that Russia is China's top supplier of crude oil. Putin is supplying even more oil than Saudi Arabia to Beijing. And according to the EIA, Russian crude to China has actually increased since the start of the war. In 2022, it was around 1.7 million barrels a day on par with the Saudis. But this has increased by an incredible 23%, hitting 2.1 million barrels a day. Remember that China is not paying the market price for the oil. You see those flashing numbers of crude oil on Wall Street, it's lower than that. And here's the pricing. In July, Russia's discount to China was around $6 per barrel. And that's around a 7-8% to discount, which is still enormous savings considering China is buying millions of barrels a day. Sure, the discount has fallen from $8.50 down to 6 bucks, but it's because domestic demand in Russia is rising and the sanctions are failing. So it's not exactly a tragedy that the discount is narrowing. But the fact still stands. China is getting cheap oil from Russia. Revenues are flowing in from Beijing. So both sides are benefiting big from this partnership. And if you're China, you want the cheap oil. You need the cheap oil. There's still a real estate crisis going on and China needs to keep inflation as low as possible. And here's the funny thing. China's oil demand keeps rising higher and higher. Their oil imports have climbed by 21% from July and were up by over 30% from a year earlier. Here's why China loves the partnership with Russia. Their refining margins have jumped by almost 100%, from $660 to almost $13 a barrel. So Chinese refiners are making a ton of money. They are essentially refining cheap Russian crude 
as selling their oil products at elevated prices to Europe. Russia is clearing their huge volumes of oil and funding their economy, while China is raking in money from the West. But I want us to pay attention to what Wang Yi said to Lavrov during the start of the talks. It really gives us an idea of what Russia and China are planning down the road. Listen to this. The more violent the unilateral actions of a Germany and bloc confrontation become, the more important for us to keep up with the times, show a sense of duty as great powers and further fulfill our international obligations. And let's sit back and analyze what this means. Hmm, what is Wang Yi alluding to? What is he thinking? Well, he's obviously alluding to Russia and China reshaping the world order which means they will be bending closer together in every possible way. Whether it's through joint security or integrating their economies together, it's going to happen sooner or later. And a big part of this is diversifying their investments and infrastructure with each other. We know China has been collaborating a lot with the Saudis when it comes to oil, but all these investments are situated in China and there's a reason why. And that's because the United States still has a big military presence in the Middle East. And it's no accident that Aramco's billion dollar investment is situated in eastern China. It is on home turf, so there's no counterparty risk. And here's where things get really interesting. China is now moving to build an oil transshipment complex in Russia itself. In a new report, China is going to invest 5 billion yuan to construct the facility on Russian soil in the Far East region. And this tells us two critical things. Firstly, Russia is diversifying away from Europe fast. They'll be sending all their oil towards China and this complex will be the hub where oil is stored and then transported. And this is part of Russia's leaning towards the East approach because relations have truly broken down with the West. China, on the other hand, will be more energy secure. They don't need to just rely on shipments from the Gulf states, which could always get interrupted. And let's project this out. Over the next 10 or 20 years, we can expect Russia and China to invest more amongst themselves they also invest across the BRICS countries, which is their own form of French shoring. We will only invest in countries that share our values and our goals. We want to de-risk, we want to decouple from the West. And if you want to blame someone or something, right, you just need to look at the Western sanctions. Now, during my time in oil and gas, every year we will go to the APEC conference in Singapore, right? It's basically a gathering of the top oil traders in the world, all gossiping about the markets. Then there are these awesome after parties where people just go out to hang out and to drink. But during the recent conference, there were a ton of voices that mentioned how the sanctions are fueling the rise of the BRICS. All these oil price caps are pushing the BRICS alliance closer to each other. And according to the energy trader Vitol, the flip side of sanctions is that it is creating stronger bonds between BRICS countries, which is in turn a sort of an opposite force of polar opposites to Western politics. So we can expect China and Russia to consolidate their strategy with BRICS. More investment dollars will be pulled from the Western economies and circulate more within BRICS. In Wang Yi's meeting with Lavrov, the topics revolve around preserving their sovereignty and not being swayed by third parties. And this is part of their common cause and shared responsibility. And to do this, Russia and China have to build up their own economies and industries. And we kind of know what's going on in the West. America is trying to build their manufacturing hubs across the world in places like Vietnam. And that's why Biden traveled all the way to Ho Chi Minh City, looking like the best dressed tourist in Vietnam collecting an award. But America might already be on the back foot. All the tax sanctions, all the restrictions haven't really worked. And now China's new breakthrough threatens to flip the script on Washington. Huawei just launched their 7 nanometer chip and integrated it into their phones. Do you know what that means? China now has the capability to produce advanced microchips that can harness the true power of 5G. In a story by Bloomberg, America is coping with this shocking news. They said there's no evidence that China can make advanced chips at scale, which is once again a form of coping and seriously underestimating the competition. Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo is upset about the phone's release during her visit. It's an obvious move by Beijing, laughing at the face of American tax sanctions. Unless Raimondo herself lives within the chip fabrication plant, there's no way to say that China can't produce at scale. Even if they can't, that's their next step and will mass produce those chips for sure. And it won't be a surprise if those chips or even newer chips eventually end up in Russia one way or another. In a previous video, we covered how Russia is harvesting the natural resources of the Arctic, moving to increase their LNG production there by 200%. Where do you think the additional production will go? 
their first port of call will of course be China. Putin is already sending record amounts of oil through the Arctic Sea route to China. And here's the kicker. The voyage time is cut down by at least 30%, meaning the oil sold into China will factor in a nice discount. Russia can sell more oil while China pays less. So it's becoming increasingly clear that the economic partnership they have. China is developing their tech industry while providing Russia with finished goods. Russia is providing China with the cheap commodities to run their industries and to help subsidize costs. And let's talk about the main event, the big kahuna, and why Wang Yi went to Moscow. And that is to pave the way for Putin's meeting with President Xi. Now, this is going to be a historic meeting. Putin hasn't been traveling much this year. He skipped the G20 meeting and didn't want to risk it at the BRICS summit because of the ICC warrant, right? But now Russia has confirmed Putin will physically head to Beijing. Listen to this report from Reuters. Putin and Xi to meet in Beijing in October. And this is big. Unlike the G20 summit, when Putin and Xi, they get together, things get done. They are probably planning something big that might shock the world. These changes not seen in 100 years aren't done yet. Putin and Xi, they are revamping the menu and they are cooking up a storm. While China's Belt Road Initiative is going strong, there is a new challenge from the West that we can't ignore. And this comes in the form of the trade corridor that links India to the Middle East and then to Europe as well. This essentially is America's counter to China's BRI, plain and simple. Now, there's some pushback on this plan, especially from Turkey, which isn't on board. The route won't pass through Turkey, so Erdogan isn't happy about this. But there's still some collateral damage to the BRI. At the G20 summit, Italy told the Chinese Premier Li Qiang that they were planning to quit the Belt Road. Now, maybe it's because of the Western pressure to join the trade corridor, or maybe it's simply about trade imbalance. But the fact still remains that Italy, the only G7 member, is moving to pull out of the agreement. So China probably needs to consolidate with Russia on a BRI. In the first half of 2023, China didn't finance any projects in Russia. However, this will likely change in 2024 after October's BRI summit. We'll see more Chinese money pour into Russia because the BRI is essentially the de-dollarization highway. It's an international trade route that is truly global. We can see that it spans across Southeast Asia to Eastern Europe towards the Middle East. Then it stretches across the continent of Africa, beyond the Atlantic Ocean to South America. And as long as China and Russia holds the BRI, they can effectively push out their de-dollarization ambitions. They can slowly chip away at the dollar's dominance now, this doesn't mean that the world reserve currency will collapse tomorrow or next year or even in the next five years. But over the next few decades, its status will erode more and more. China needs Russia in the BRI and vice versa. Russia is instrumental in helping push out the Chinese yuan to the world. And here's a statistic that is quite shocking. 44% of payments in Russia's forex transaction is done in the Chinese currency. Russia is selling their commodities oil and gas to the world and pricing them in yuan. He has long exceeded the dollar's market share and represents almost half of foreign business done in Russia. The BRI is important for China, not just because it facilitates trade, but because it is likely the main avenue for the global south to push back against the US dollar. They can't do it in the financial or the capital markets, so they are using trade as a golden opportunity. And that's why Biden is trying to push back against the Belt Road it's not just about trade, but securing the dollar's hegemony. So we are moving towards a bifurcated world. We have talked about it for over a year now and things are coming true. And here's what we can expect. China and Russia will move to consolidate their supply chains and their currency flows. They will continue to shun the US dollar and trade more amongst themselves. And here are some facts. In a visit to China, Russia's economy minister made two statements that tells us the trajectory of their economies. Trade between Russia and China soared by 30% in the first half of this year and will rise to more than $200 billion in 2023. Both countries are trading more and more with each other. And here's the big one. We are actively developing investments, including in our large gas and petrochemical projects where we actively use Chinese technologies. And this sums up the entire situation, right? Russia will be developing their oil and gas projects and it will be powered using Chinese technology. And I think there's no going back on this. The world will never be the same. And this split towards multipolarity isn't going to stop. So prepare for another turning point in this Game of Thrones this October. 
Putin will be meeting Xi in Beijing. They're going to talk about reshaping the current world order and maybe making some pancakes together again. Anything is possible when these two come together. But let me know what you think in the comments below. What's going to happen come October? And what new plans will China and Russia have? Let me know in the comments below. They say be sure to smash the like button and subscribe as we navigate through these crazy times.